This program contains coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. For 200 years, it has been Canada's most feared address. Kingston will always hold that thing as being the toughest maximum security prison. For inmates, there was hard time, and then there was Kingston pen time. You learn about life very quickly. The old saying, if the walls could talk, we've got an inside ear. Live or die, it didn't matter. I was prepared to die. And the stories, you can't make this stuff up. You worked or you went to the hole. That's the answer to everything. I'm Anne Marie McDonald. This Doc Zone is telling tales from KP. Beside the yachts and idyllic views of Lake Ontario, it stands. To me, when I look at that building, I, I just, it radiates pain. At the age of 17, I was uh, quite afraid of going through this big steel door. 30 meters high. 130 meters wide, 433 cells, a walled city dating back to Victorian times. When I first came to prison, I got, I had nightmares. Built by its own inhabitants before Canada was born, the Kingston Maximum Security Penitentiary is one of the oldest functioning prisons in the world. What began as a grand experiment in Victorian idealism and rehabilitation now exists as the final home for the country's most notorious criminals. It was a difficult prison to work in. Known as KP, in 2014, it will close its doors. But the memories of those who know this prison as inmates or as guards will live on forever. These are their stories of redemption, punishment, and trauma. In 1923, a massive manhunt was underway in Kingston, Ontario. Convicted bank robber Red Ryan and four accomplices broke out of the Kingston Penitentiary. Dozens of men looked for them in the forest, but they disappeared. What Ryan did was practically unthinkable because KP was designed to be a fortress. One hundred years before Ryan's escape, there was no Canada, just a scattering of colonies on a rugged frontier. Justice was meted out at local jails. Conditions were primitive. In the 1820s, there was a lot of criticism about the conditions of the small local jails that would house everyone. Uh, men, women, children, debtors, people, they were known as madmen then, people awaiting trial for murder, you know, everyone. The government of Upper Canada needed a better plan, a large institution, a penitentiary, a social statement. A penitentiary, as its name implies, should be a place to lead a man to repent of his sins and amend his life. And if it has that effect, so much the better. Criminals were seen as morally and spiritually ill. With the right environment and conditioning, they could be cured. It was built to force people to be penitent. So it was built in order to isolate. To isolate and to allow other people to be vigilant. To achieve this, the prison enforced one critical rule, total silence. The inmates were not too... Um, uh, speak, laugh, giggle, run, jump, you know, any, any outward um, expression was not, not permitted. They really wanted that, um, that monastic atmosphere that would force inner reflection as they felt as part of the rehabilitation process. 
If you had to deal with a guard about something, you walked up to the guard, you shut your mouth, and you stood five feet away from it, and you waited for him to acknowledge that you existed. Robbie Robidoux was sent to KP when he was 17. The only time we were, we were allowed to communicate with each other was when uh, we went to the shop or we went to exercise. It was done through various disciplinary regulations that even prohibited whistling. Whistling and singing songs, keeping in mind the notion of the prisoner as the morally and spiritually ill. The more people with those qualities were able to communicate with each other, they either maintained those qualities or tainted each other. By 1835, the south wing of the penitentiary was complete, 144 cells. The first inmate was Matthew Tavender, sentenced to three years for grand larceny. Soon he was joined by other prisoners, including women and children. The youngest that I'm aware of right now was Antoine Bochet, who arrived in 1845 from Montreal. He was eight years old and sentenced to three years for picking pockets in Montreal. They lived in airless cubicles with a bucket for waste, a thin bed, and just enough room to stand. The cell consists of a bed that you had to fold up uh, on the wall to be able to go back and forth, to pace back and forth, because one thing about prison is that you learn how to pace and <laughs> back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There were four cell blocks in all, spokes of a wheel joining a central rotunda, which would come to be known as the dome. When I walked into the dome, that's when prison really hit me. This is Kingston Penitentiary. And in the middle stood the one instrument which broke through the silence. A bell, its ring dictating the movement of every inmate. It came to represent the, the control and the, the, uh, the symbolism of the, um, the uh, reg regimentation and um, the hampered freedom of the individual. It ran our life. The bell ran our life. This rigidity was typical of the rules at KP. Every convict shall not gaze at visitors in the prison. He shall not be anywhere without prior permission. When approaching an officer, he shall do so respectfully. And punishment often meant the cats. After receiving 1,200 lashes, one inmate was declared insane by the prison surgeon. Inmates as young as 11 years old were whipped for speaking French. If that didn't work, there were other forms of discipline, such as the coffin. Prisoners would be locked inside and forced to stand. Then there was a device called the shower bath. They'd strap a prisoner to, if he was bad, to this big chair, and above his head was a sort of a small barrel. They, they'd put this barrel, put his head into this barrel, close it up, and run water into the barrel. And, and they wouldn't drown the guy, but he, he would think he's going to be drowned. In 1847 alone, Kingston Penn guards delivered the following forms of justice. Meals of bread and water, 5,104 times. The box, 759 times. The cats, 58 times. Confined to own cell, 73 times. Confined to dark cell, 69 times. While life inside the prison was tough, outside it was seen as a beacon of Victorian enlightenment. Locals paid to see the convicts hard at work. And no less a luminary than Charles Dickens toured the prison while on a North American visit. There is an admirable jail here, well and wisely governed, and excellently regulated in every respect. The men were employed as shoemakers, rope makers, blacksmiths, tailors, carpenters, and stone cutters. Decades later, the workshops were still a fact of life. The first shop that I worked in was Canvas. 
which is where they made mailbags for the Canadian mail. Um, and then I went to a utility gang. We did maintenance and repair and cleanup and whatnot all over the prison. Soon the inmates became sought after for their skills. Uniforms for the Northwest Mounted Police. Railings for the Parliamentary Library. And the stonework for this church with a very ironic name. The nearby limestone quarry came to define the notion of backbreaking labor. This was the inmates' work to sit 10 hours a day with a hammer in one hand, reducing great blocks of limestone to pea-sized paving stone. 10 hours a day, they leaned over the rock, pulverizing the stone, breathing the dust-choked air. For the prisoners, it was a life with few choices. To refuse to work had dire consequences. You worked or you went to the hole. That's the answer to everything. Politely known as the dissociation unit, it meant total isolation. In the morning, they would take your mattress out at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning, take your mattress out. At nighttime, they would give it back to you. You would bring your mattress back in. Um, you were allowed the Bible only for reading material, um, and that was it. There was one very articulate uh, piece of testimony where a prisoner describes how night after night he listened to another prisoner segregated further down the range, screaming all night long, and explained, when I heard his madness, I knew that it would become my madness too. Despite the strict rules against talking, inmates often created ingenious methods to exchange information. They would tap a Morse code on the pipes of their, of their toilet or their sink. They had a whole code of knotted strings, and then they would toss it out of between their bars. Simons discovered this firsthand when she uncovered a stash of letters in her attic. They were written after the First World War by a convict, Joseph Clareau, to a local woman, Phyllis Halliday. Smuggled out of the prison, the letters were left in hiding spots throughout the quarry. My dear little friend Peggy, at present I am sitting on the edge of my bed with a blanket over my shoulders and a white rag around my head. It's aching, but just a little. Outside of asthma and a little headache, I am sound. So far, this place has not injured my health, but many a poor devil dies in here with consumption. Stone is a very bad article to work near. There are, Peggy, all classes of men in this institution, in every walk of life, from judge on down to petty thieves, but we are all one in here. We all go through the same punishment, no matter who or what he was before he came in here. With water on one side and guards watching in towers, it was practically impossible to escape from KP. But that didn't stop prisoners from trying. Mundane objects like toothbrushes and rulers became lethal instruments of justice and tools for breaking out. There's a kind of a general request in prison for homemade knives, so you know, we, we made a few knives in the metal shop. There were hundreds of escape attempts, but few successes. Red Ryan was one of them. After he escaped, the Toronto Star sent a young reporter named Ernest Hemingway to cover the story. In the dark, there was a rush across the road. The guards fired into the dark at the sound and rushed forward. A man's voice said, are you hurt, Shorty? The guard shot again where the voice came from, and one of them fired point blank. There is no blood, and there are no bodies. Ryan was eventually recaptured. Years after he was paroled, he was killed in a botched robbery near Sarnia, Ontario. According to news reports, officers shot him as full of holes as a soup strainer. Outside or inside the penitentiary, violence is never far away. Coming up, learning to live with fear. You know, be careful what you say. Don't leave yourself vulnerable. Don't talk like you have money on the street. I'm walking in line, all of a sudden, 
a guy falls out of line, he's got a knife stuck in him. Ford cars are stuck in the past. Boring. You know, that's what I always thought. But cruise control that adjusts the traffic. A car that virtually parks itself. I'm talking about a car I can talk to, and it does what I say. I gotta say, I never had this stuff in the past. And anytime I drive anyone anywhere, they're more surprised than I was. Think you know Ford? You've never driven a Ford like this. time to get your flu shot because the sooner you get it the sooner you're protected this year it's more convenient than ever you can get it from your doctor a clinic and now at participating pharmacies visit ontario.ca slash flu ford cars are stuck in the past boring you know that's what i always thought but cruise control that adjusts the traffic a car that virtually parks itself i'm talking about a car i can talk to and it does what I say. I gotta say, I never had this stuff in the past. And anytime I drive anyone anywhere, they're more surprised than I was. Think you know Ford? You've never driven a Ford like this. time to get your flu shot because the sooner you get it the sooner you're protected this year it's more convenient than ever you can get it from your doctor a clinic and now at participating pharmacies visit ontario.ca slash flu this program contains coarse language viewer discretion is advised Throughout the winter of 1920, convict Joseph Clareau continued his clandestine relationship with a local Kingston woman, Phyllis Halliday. My dear Peggy, eight new men came in the prison today. The oldest don't look to be any more than 20, and their sentences run from eight to 15 years. My, but it hurts me to see that. And three of them are returned soldiers. One poor fellow in particular goes around on crutches. He has only one leg, the other one was amputated above the knee. I give him tobacco every other day or so, for he sure has my sympathy. Yes, indeed, Peggy. This is a place of sighs and tears. It took all your wits to survive in the Kingston pen. From the outside, it looked menacing. On the inside, it was worse. When I arrived in uh, Kingston a uh, few days, uh, maybe a week or so, um, I put this tattoo on uh, FTW, and what it means is fuck the world. They would uh, give you like what they call a whiffle haircut um, and give you a prison drab. And my uh, outfit uh, had a Y, 6897. Uh, the Y meant that I was a youth. Wayne Ford was convicted of theft and later of killing his mother in one of the most sensational crimes in Toronto during the 1960s. I gave up being Wayne Ford when I signed those papers and I became 2778. And everywhere I went in the prison, I was addressed as 2778 by the guards. As a young offender, Robbie Robidoo knew the label carried its own dangers. The, the, the month that I spent in the Don Jail with older cons kind of warmed me up to what to expect going into the penitentiary because of my age. Um, as a youth, uh, there was older people who were looking for kids, for, for a sweet kid or uh, for a homosexual lover. I remember when I went in, the first thing they do is shave your head. And, uh, and I grew a Fu Manchu mustache because I wanted to look as tough as I could. 
One of the first things I learned was that I was a fish. They called new guys coming in fish. And I remember asking a guy, how come you call us fish? And he goes, haven't you ever seen you guys? <laughs> Mouth open, eyes big looking. <laughs> and so that's why we look like fish. So I was a fish the first night. You have fear all the time, you know, here, because you're in the penitentiary, you never know what's gonna go on. There were unwritten rules. You did not whistle. If you forgot yourself and started to whistle, you would have 18 guys tell you harshly, shut your fucking mouth. You gotta watch out for the little nut bars, not the big guys. The big guys will come at you, you can see it coming, it's the ones that come from behind. And beware of small gifts sitting on your cot. The goodies were like cigarettes and chocolate bars and that, right? That if you took anything out of the box, um, that you would um, be that person's kid, right? You know, I was aware of guys who had done, um, you know, nefarious things to the food, let's say, whether it be, you know, whatever it was, whether it be spit or whether it be urine or something. But, you know, I inspected my food very closely. I took a very good look and, and I tried, and I stuck mainly to things that were very uh, stews and soup I wouldn't eat. I let it be known that, you know, like if you mess with me, you're going to get hurt real bad. I was in Kingston for maybe, uh, 10 months or a year, and I started uh, weightlifting. So in no time, maybe in eight months, I went from 235 pounds to 285 pounds. At a 57 inch chest, I was bench pressing 405 pounds. What do I have to worry about? Then there were the odd rituals, which only took place at the Kingston Pen. A, a trustee came with a big cart with all these dusty old books on it, and guys were grabbing bunches of them. And I thought, you know, I'm cool, I don't read, you know? And I didn't think anything of it. And then the first night in bed, I found out why they have books. The rats come up out of the toilets, and you need to cover the toilets. If life was tough for the inmates, it certainly wasn't easy for the guards. Bob Charlton was hired in 1973. He had no experience and no training. I had no idea where to go or what to do. <laughs> and uh, I kept on saying, you know, why did I do this? And uh, an officer gave me a key and told me to unlock uh, A block, lower A. And they let me in the barrier and closed the barrier behind me and I'm down the range and the inmates were locked up and um, there was an inmate there in the cell who showed me how to hold the key and unlock the door. That was my first day. But this friendliness was the exception, not the rule. The relationship between inmates and guards was tense. They were nasty, they were brutal. You know, you simmer in there and you hate them. You know, you hate them. But you have to, you know, there's not a lot you can do because they got total control. Or they did have total control up until a certain point. Even veteran officers like Vern Thibodeau felt the ominous presence of the Kingston Penitentiary. It, it was rough. I, I, I don't really know how to get into it other than I just, it was rough. Out of all the prisons, KP bothered me, seemed to bother me more than any other. Through the years, to maintain a sense of order, the penitentiary was run like a tight ship. Your shirt is done right up tight, right to the collar. Your sleeves are down, they're buttoned up, your shirt is tucked in. You walked neat and orderly, you went to wherever it was you're gonna go, and then you could talk to the other inmate. And every movement was signaled by the clanging of the bell. The bell signaled everything that was going on movement-wise in the cell block, in the dome and cell block, each day, seven days a week. Inmate Roger Caron was haunted by the bell. He remembered it in his award-winning book, Go Boy. To the cons, it was an object of repugnance and outrage, an unjustifiable punishment, a brass monster that we were convinced had been designed solely to shatter our nerves with its loud and strident ringing. Another source of tension was the total lack of privacy. Mail was censored in Kingston. Um, they read every letter that came in and they read every letter that went out. And if you said anything that was in detrimental to the good order of the institution, 
um, they would uh, they would cut it out. So your letter <laughs> would be all in pieces because uh, you know you weren't allowed to say anything that was against the institution. Like I hate this fucking place. As in the 19th century, Kingston Pen remained a working prison. Prisoners were taught practical skills. I learned a lot in prison. Uh, my first thing, because I worked all the time, I'm a workaholic, so I got that out of prison. I went in as a thief, I come out as a working chef. Like any other community, it had its recreational activities. There was even an inmate radio show, which was broadcast throughout Ontario. Kingston Penitentiary is on the air. We didn't have TVs or anything like that in those days, so you got one movie a week down in the gymnasium. They set up chairs, the sports gang set up folding chairs down there, and everybody would go down and watch a movie. That was a big deal. Still, you never forgot where you were and why. Well, I found uh, an inmate murdered. Um, looked in a cell and his uh, mattress was on the floor and I thought that odd and opened up the cell door and went in and and uh, uh, and pulled up the mattress and the inmate was there and he'd been stabbed uh, I think they said 60 sometimes and through his eyes and he had defense wounds all over his hand and arms and his whole torso and upper uh, lower body or when correctional officer Vern Thibodeau discovered an inmate who had obtained the autopsy photos of his victim. That, that, that did get to me. My, I looked at that uh, girl on the slab, and uh, she was about the age of my daughter at the time. And that inmate looking at me, and it didn't bother him a bit. He's just looking at me and saying, well, you know, type of thing. And, uh, what I had to do was get the heck away and walk around a bit and sort of try to get myself a little calmer. Strict discipline lasted well into the 20th century. Corporal punishment like whipping was on the books until 1972. And the isolation unit continued as a common form of punishment. I was in the hole there for three days and uh, it was, uh, again, loud. Um, I was in my own little spot, but uh, constant screaming, banging. Um, you know, there's a, a real sense of despair uh, that I felt from the place. In the 1950s and 60s, electroshock therapy was administered by prison doctors. Robbie Robidoux received it. It's a terrifying experience to go down there, to, to go down to that room where, where they're going to tie you up, tie your hands and tie your legs, and then shoot that sodium pentothal into your you know, arm and knock you out, and then put the thing around your head and then and give you the electric, the, the, the shock. It, it's scary. For many inmates, there was one preoccupation, escape. If you couldn't scale the walls, there were other ways to sneak out. I do know there was at, at least one successful escape where the guy, I don't know what he did, but he got himself to the outside hospital and then escaped from the hospital. Got caught later on and got brought back in. We knew of uh, a plot uh, of uh, at least three inmates tried to was going to escape. So I was on the range and I used to search the cell quite often. I got out twice, uh, both times manipulating. Uh, one time I paid to get to camp and took off, and the other time I, they released me on, on a mistake and I got away. With a prison so regimented, with punishment so common, and with freedom so elusive, inmates often took desperate measures. Vern Thibodeau remembers being taken hostage by an inmate. My stomach, of course, took a nosedive, as it happens quite often, and I thought, geez, here I go again. You can't get out to the door, no weapons, no nothing. And I, I kind of thought I might be in a bit of a trouble on this one. Anyway, we talked. I got him calmed down and talked into going back to a cell. The threat of prisoner violence was constant, and sometimes it would boil over. The first riot at the Kingston Penitentiary was in 1932. 20 years later, violence erupted again. Kingston Penitentiary. 
scene of the worst prison riot in Canadian history. Inmates set fire to the shop areas and rampaged through the building. With few improvements, the Kingston pen remained a tinderbox waiting for a match. When we return, the prison finally explodes. You know, live or die, it didn't matter, right? I mean, I was uh, at a point in my life where it didn't, it didn't fucking matter. Um, and I was prepared to die. Ford cars were stuck in the past. Boring. You know, that's what I always thought. But cruise control that adjusts the traffic. A car that virtually parks itself. I'm talking about a car I can talk to, and it does what I say. I gotta say, I never had this stuff in the past. And anytime I drive anyone anywhere, they're more surprised than I was. Think you know Ford? You've never driven a Ford like this. time to get your flu shot because the sooner you get it the sooner you're protected this year it's more convenient than ever you can get it from your doctor a clinic and now at participating pharmacies visit ontario.ca slash flu ford cars were stuck in the past boring you know that's what i always thought but cruise control that adjusts the traffic a car that virtually parks itself i'm talking about a car i can talk to and it does what I say. I gotta say, I never had this stuff in the past. And anytime I drive anyone anywhere, they're more surprised than I was. Think you know Ford? You've never driven a Ford like this. time to get your flu shot because the sooner you get it the sooner you're protected this year it's more convenient than ever you can get it from your doctor a clinic and now at participating pharmacies visit ontario.ca slash flu In 1971, Kingston Penn had a population of 641 inmates, including 14 who required protective custody. There was tension in the air. You had the festering of grievances about treatment, dealing with food, visits, uh, discriminatory application of internal rules. Adding to inmates' jitters, a new penitentiary was set to open called Millhaven. A lot of the rumors going around, circulating around the joint, was that um, there was going to be cameras everywhere, that you were going to be 24 hours under observation. You know, guys were all paranoid. You know, we don't think positive, we think negative. On April 14th, 1971, six inmates overpowered the guards in the gymnasium and seized control. More inmates soon joined in. I'm in my cell, and at 10.30, I start hearing this commotion that is gradually building and building and building. You know, and it takes me a few minutes to figure out it's not just a fight, it's something more serious. By 11 o'clock, I know this is a prison takeover, and I'm locked in my cell, and I'm afraid they're going to light the place up, and I'm going to burn to death in my cell. Six guards were taken hostage. One of them was a young corrections officer named Carrie Bushell. He had just been laid off from DuPont. KP was supposed to be a temporary job. Uh, anything that I had of any value whatsoever was taken from me and everybody else, too. You know, I think they might have ripped my shirt or something like that. I mean, they meant business, and, uh, and basically we knew that, so all we could do was comply. 12.30 came, he wasn't there. I was getting kind of, well, what's keeping him? I think about 6 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, 
and they informed me that he was a hostage in the riot. In the Malay, the inmates destroyed their cells and barricaded all entrances to the central rotunda. We just went along smashing everything. You know, it was just, uh, you know, let's tear this friggin' fucking this place down, right? You know, and for me, um, for the first time, I was now I just turned 18, and for me, the first time in my life, I felt like I had some control over authority. I mean, we had six guards hostage. Uh, we had the joint. Um, it was, it was, it was pretty good. We, I really enjoyed it. Then one of the rioters smashed the most hated symbol of the Kingston Penitentiary. A friend of mine named Mikey Logan got the bell. As soon as he got out of his cell, he ran right down to the dome, found a big steel pipe or bar, and beat the living shit out of that bell. He just destroyed it in a million pieces, eh? And he was just happy. The, the riot, the greatest thing that happened in the riot for Mikey, he got the bell. By now, the entire prison was under the control of inmates like Wayne Ford, and they were determined to bring about change. We wanted to modernize the prison system. We were living in an archaic system with striped shirts, numbers over our pockets. We wanted to be regarded as live human beings. We wanted to be able to grow our hair any length we wanted rather than real short. We wanted to be able to grow a beard or a mustache. One of our biggest things, we wanted to be regarded by name rather than number. We're gonna use this riot as our vehicle to try to change the archaic piece of shit prison system that Canada had in this Kingston Penitentiary. We're going to have to the inmates demanded to air their grievances with a citizens group. One of them was a young lawyer named Aubrey Golden. There were guards with guns and only alcoves behind me. So, you know, we were we were really aware that they could, and they did, in fact, fire off some shots to, you know, to, to keep keep the authority. That, that was the worst fear we had. We knew those guns were loaded. We knew that they they could kill. They weren't they weren't pea shooters. On day two of the riot, Wayne Ford was looking out his window. The north gate explodes open, and in comes the military. You know, quick time. Bulletproof vests, helmets, SMG, machine guns, you know, the whole ball of wax running side by side into the prison, and I damn near shit my pants. And I'm thinking, we're all gonna die. The army was preparing for the worst. Pressure was building. There were people lined up outside on the sidewalk, and a lot of them were carrying signs, you know, free the hostages, uh, uh, you know, take action or whatever. The inmates had threatened to cut the fingers off some of the hostages if their, what they wanted wasn't met. So at that point, it got a little hairy. You know, I knew they'd be worried, this, especially Elaine, so. <clears throat> I didn't have any children yet. On the third day, the hostage crisis grew more desperate and ominous. For 92 spine-tingling hours, the negotiations went on while a gut-eating tension, lack of food and sleep reduced us to near savages. We struggled in the tornado-like ruins to survive, squatting over bonfires and cooking scraps of meat like cavemen. With little food and sleep, the situation spun out of control. A breakaway group, including Robbie Robidoux, grabbed sex offenders, informants, and others in protective custody. They were brought to the rotunda and tied to chairs. It wasn't a planned thing that we're gonna take out these undesirables and these sex offenders and put them in a circle and beat their brains out and kill them. That wasn't what the intention, that wasn't the plan. One of those tied up was a convict named Brian Enser. I got accused of, 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 of putting the final touch to him, right? Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Because I was pretty high at the time. Um, and so I, you know, 
I'm told that I did, um, but whether I did, I don't, I don't know that for a fact. The end was coming, and both inmates and officials wanted to avoid further bloodshed. A plan to release the hostages was reached. Among the first was Carrie Bushell. You knew you were leaving the other guys, then, you know. Walked down through all the military, and they took me home. So, uh, and all, it, <clears throat> that's all I was worried about was those guys. <laughs> As soon as it was safe, officials and the media entered the prison. I remember walking around some pipes lying around and uh, bars, the iron bars were torn right off. The riot led to an inquiry and sweeping changes at KP and at other prisons across Canada. Robbie Robidoux was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to six additional years in the killing of Brian Enser. He was sent to the Millhaven Maximum Security Penitentiary. Wayne Ford was also transferred to Millhaven. I'm proud of what our group and the population did is in a group, as an entity, that we had a riot in a penitentiary that was archaic that was outdated, and we forced the Canadian system to change and modernize and humanitize the prison system, even a little bit. Coming up next, the worst of the worst, the final role for the Kingston Penitentiary. Fords are gas guzzlers. That's what my dad used to say. The gas guzzlers don't save me a ton in gas money. And they don't get over 900 highway clicks to the tank. And they definitely don't plug in. Electric. Gas. Hybrid. Ford's got them all. Dad's never seen a car like this before, let alone one from Ford. Think you know Ford? You've never driven a Ford like this. time to get your flu shot because the sooner you get it the sooner you're protected this year it's more convenient than ever you can get it from your doctor a clinic and now at participating pharmacies visit ontario.ca slash flu fords are gas guzzlers that's what my dad used to say the gas guzzlers don't save me a ton in gas money and they don't get over 900 highway clicks to the tank and they definitely don't plug in an electric gas Hybrid. Ford's got them all. Dad's never seen a car like this before, let alone one from Ford. Think you know Ford? You've never driven a Ford like this. to get your flu shot because the sooner you get it the sooner you're protected this year it's more convenient than ever you can get it from your doctor a clinic and now at participating pharmacies visit ontario.ca slash flu for almost 180 years the kingston penitentiary has stood resolute an imposing structure on the canadian landscape it survived fires and riots however by the end of the 20th century the prison was notorious for its gang culture there was a period of time certainly in the 80s where a, a group of tough prisoners basically enforced discipline in the institution um, convenient for the administration, 
avoids problems that can blow up. Um, quite sad for the vulnerable group of prisoners who are obviously subordinated in that kind of internal regime. In desperation, many inmates turned to extreme measures. They would start cutting themselves with everything, razor blades, cutting their throats. Seeing the self-destructive nature of guys when they came in uh, really affected me. On top of all this, part of the prison was being converted into a protective custody unit for Canada's most infamous criminals. In 1982, Clifford Olson arrived at KP. The notorious Beast of BC killed 11 young people. Bob Charlton escorted him to the prison. He was uh, very small um, and uh, he talked very well. And uh, he carried on a conversation and uh, up until uh, we saw the walls of KP. And that was the first time I noticed that his demeanor changed somewhat. I noticed him uh, stiffen in his seat and I, I remember looking at him and uh, I'd like to think I was the uh, one of the few people that actually saw him scared. While Lee Chappelle was serving time at the Kingston Pen, his area overlooked the yard used by serial killer Paul Bernardo. Guys were, you know, like looking for him and if he did come into the yard, yeah, there was, uh, they were prepared uh, you know, with glasses of urine or whatever they could come up with to throw on him. KP was starting to show its age. Other big Victorian era penitentiaries across North America were already closed. In April 2012, it became Kingston's turn. Institutions built in the 19th century are not appropriate for managing a 21st century inmate population. Inmates and guards are being transferred to other facilities in a process that will take two years. However, some tough issues remain. My big question is whether this was done precipitously. Where are the prisoners going to go? You can pop a hundred new cells into an institution. I'm sure there are creative ways to do the construction. But what about healthcare? What about food? What about visits? And what about the building itself? Some see the real estate potential. Others want to turn it into a tourist attraction. Because when these doors close, a chapter in Canadian history will be ending as well. What began as the provincial penitentiary of the province of Upper Canada became the most feared institution in this country. Its intent was redemption. In practice, it was punishment. For its founders, it was considered a success. It put Canada into uh, co a comparable position with other countries around the world that had moved to these large, awesome, centralized institutions. However, for those who lived and worked within these walls, the memories will never fade away. I grew up there. You know, I was just a, this young boy, when you look at that picture, and uh, you learn about life very quickly. Bob Charlton became a manager in the correctional system. He retired in 2009. Robbie Robidoux was paroled in 1987. He worked for 13 years as a youth street worker. Kingston will always hold that thing as being the toughest maximum security prison in Canada. Rick Osborne got his BA before leaving prison in 2002. He is now a youth mentor. Lee Chappelle was released in 2009. He started an anti-bullying and crime prevention program. If those walls could talk, the stories they'd be able to tell. Vern Thibodeau became a correctional supervisor. Upon retirement, he wrote a memoir called The Door. I was very, very naive when I went into the penitentiary. I learned a lot about people. Most of it I don't like. Wayne Ford left prison in 1975. He became a public speaker and worked with inmates in BC and Ontario. Kerry Bushell left KP a few months after the 1971 riot. The Bushells have two children and four grandchildren. There's some holiday programming in the coming weeks, but we're still thinking seasonally. 
Winter sucks. I don't think anybody actually likes it. Is it over between Canadians and winter? Winter is not fun. I am tired of winter. Why do we let the Russians and Swedes have all the fun? Canada, maybe it's time to get our winter mojo back. Life Below Zero, next time. 2013 is going to be a busy year at Dock Zone. Here's a look at a few titles coming in January. The earthquakes have been rocking Yellowstone. An eruption like Yellowstone could trigger the end of civilization as we know it. Every single product that is being manufactured is being counterfeited. Paul, are you there? Would you like to take the corgis out for a walk? I'm Anne-Marie MacDonald. You can always watch our documentaries at cbc.ca slash doczone. Thanks for joining us.